Well, good morning, brothers and sisters. Get, oh, well, that's a shorter stool than I expected. I, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, want to thank the uh, worship team for that great set there, glorious music. What uh, they help before the throne of God above has, has been one of my favorites for years. It's filled with such such uh, rich truth and so uh, Christ-centered and, and uh, exalts his name and his work so greatly. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much, guys. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Slade Reinhardt. I'm the youth ministry director here, and I also oversee the uh, Adult Connect and Grow Ministries. If you haven't already done so, go ahead and turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4, starting at verse 25, as you just heard uh, Taylor read, or rather recite. Do again to my drifting focal point. I got to lower this podium just a little bit. For those of you who are new or visiting, uh, this is the tenth message in our Unity in Action series. Uh, we're preaching through the Book of Ephesians on Sunday mornings, and these messages do build on each other because, of course, we're going through a book. So what's said here relates to what was said previously. However, each message does stand on its own as well. So just to calm your fears, you won't feel lost uh, if you haven't been here before, if this is your first time. So let's go ahead and get started. As the 1971 NFL season began, the Dallas Cowboys had a problem. Their start, starting quarterback, a man by the name of Craig Morton, he's the man you see in the left there, number 14, he had been performing very well. In fact, the previous season, he'd led them all the way to the Super Bowl. They, they didn't win the Super Bowl, but they got there. But on the bench, second string currently, was a young man by the name of Roger Staubach. And Staubach had come to Landry, the coach, in the offseason and, and said, uh, I either want the chance to compete for the starting job or I want to be traded. I don't want to spend my career as a backup. So Landry promised him the chance to compete for the starting position. And as the season began, Landry still hadn't made a decision. He couldn't decide which one he wanted to go with. So what he did was uh, he would start one quarterback one week and then the other quarterback the next week and just alternate game by game. And then eventually he actually would alternate within a game one quarterback would lead a series, the next quarterback would lead the next series, so on and so forth. But that wasn't working, as you can imagine. That caused somewhat uh, chaos because of the rhythm and timing of uh, both men being different. So Landry had to make a firm decision, and he did. He decided he was going to replace Craig Morton with Roger Staubach. Now, those of you guys who are familiar with football history know that that was absolutely the right decision because Roger Staubach would then lead the Cowboys to four Super Bowls, winning two of those, and go down in history as one of the greatest quarterbacks in the, in, uh, in the NFL. But think about this for a second. Why was Landry hesitant to replace Morton with Staubach? Well, for one thing, he was familiar with Morton. He knew what he could do. He knew how he performed under pressure. He knew how he would do as the season rolled on. So he was familiar with him. He'd also had success with him. Like I mentioned, the previous year, he'd taken them all the way to the Super Bowl. And then in addition to that, he wasn't completely sure that he could trust Staubach in that role. Well, as you heard uh, Taylor recite just a moment ago, the passage that we're looking at today calls upon us to replace some things as well. And we're called upon to replace some things that we're familiar with, some things that maybe we've had success with. But unlike Landry, we don't have to wonder whether or not we can trust the replacements because in this case, God himself is handing them down to us. The, uh, well, let's, let me do this. Uh, we do every week, as we do every week, let me uh, give you a quick reminder of where we are in the book just to orient you. This chart shows the structure of Ephesians. The first half of the book, chapters 1 through 3, are primary doc primarily doctrinal, telling us this is what God has done, this is what God is like. And then uh, starting in chapter 4, for the rest of the book, it turns to a more practical uh, teaching, meaning this is how you practice your faith. So it's more focused on this is what we do in response to what God has done. Last week, we heard Todd Malone explain that the Christian life is a life of replacing a false identity, the old self, with your true identity, the new self in Christ. Today's passage gives us more specific descriptions of that work of replacement, and Paul does that by giving us a list of do's and don'ts. Now, you might be thinking, well, hold on just a minute. I, I thought that the Christian life was not 
a list of do's and don'ts. Doesn't the FBC teach that life in Christ isn't about a laundry list of do's and don'ts? Well, this is where context helps us. Verse 25 begins with the word therefore. And whenever you encounter the word therefore in a biblical passage, that means you need to look at what was said previously to figure out what that therefore is, is resulting from. At the beginning of chapter 4, Paul said, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. So notice the walk, meaning the behavior, it does not come before the calling. The calling comes before the walk. Now the calling in this context refers to the calling of the church to be a vehicle for God's glory. And it includes the individual call to salvation for each one of us. But the calling is not the result of of a worthy walk. A worthy walk results from and is a response to the calling that God has on our lives. In verse 17, Paul said of chapter 4, you must no longer walk, meaning live, as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. And then in verses 22 to 24, <clears throat> he says we should put off our old self, the person that we were before we came to know Christ, and that we should put on our new self, this new identity that we received when we trusted in Christ. A change in status comes before a change in behavior. When you believe in Christ, that he is the son of God, that he lived a perfect life, that he died on the cross to pay the penalty for your sins and then rose victoriously from the dead. When you do that, your status changes from enemy of God, alienated from God's promises to beloved child of God, standing in God's promises and being the recipient of that as well as an internal, eternal inheritance. And then you live status forward. So the status or the calling, the identity comes before the behavior. Do's and don'ts, shoulds and shouldn'ts, rules and commands are a necessary part of living under the lordship of Jesus Christ. They identify what pleases and displeases God. They guide us in loving and glorifying God and in loving our neighbor. They are not the foundation of our faith. They are not the essence of our union with Christ. In these verses, Paul is talking about living as children of God not becoming children of God. The new life is not achieved by your obedience, nor is it maintained by your obedience. Because if it was, none of us would ever achieve it, and none of us could ever maintain it. Ephesians 2, 9 says, by grace you have been saved through faith. So yes, it is true that the Christian life is not merely a list of do's and don'ts. But God has graciously given us do's and don'ts, his rules, his commands, his instructions to show us how that we should live in order to glorify him and bless those around us. So the commands that Paul is going to be giving us are all about our relationships, and it's specifically our relationships with fellow believers. Now, these, these do apply to your relationships outside of the church as well, but the specific target of this passage is your relationship with other believers. You know how it's common to be less gracious less patient and less understanding with your immediate family than with those outside your family? Have any of y'all experienced that? You don't have to raise your hands. Uh, well, in the same way, it is tempting to be less understanding, less, less gracious, and less loving with the brothers and sisters in your local church than you are with people outside of that. So Paul is putting his finger on this and saying, this is how you're supposed to live. Let's start right here in the family, those closest to you, spiritually speaking. <clears throat> now, I am just about to leave this discussion of uh, context and move on to interacting with the passage. But before I do, like Lieutenant Colombo used to say, one more thing. Most of the commands in this passage are formatted in this put off, put on structure. In other words, he says, don't do this, do this instead. And I think that, that, that the, one of the lessons from that is that, this, uh, the, that the Christian life is not just about what you don't do. It is not just about gritting your teeth and trying to avoid sin. It is about positively living out the commands of God to actually do something, to do good, to live in ways that glorify him and bless our neighbor. Okay, so uh, I've summarized this passage in four commands. And the first one is this. Replace sinful words with godly words. Replace sinful words with godly words. The old children's rhyme says, Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words can never hurt me. 
I suspect everybody in here realizes that that is absolutely untrue. We know that words can hurt. Words can damage or destroy relationships. Words can damage or destroy reputations. Sinful words can cause division in the body of Christ. And in this new life we've been given, God is telling us to put away our habit of using words in ways. Take a look at the commands that he gives related to words in this section. He says, put away falsehood, be angry and do not sin. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouths. Let all clamor and slander, clamor and slander be put away from you. Now, uh, just so that you know what's going to happen here in the next few minutes, I'm not going to drill down into every one of these commands because of, of the time constraint as well as it would really just become more of a lecture than a sermon. So I'm going to look at a few uh, of these from each category of, of command, and uh, that will give you the general idea of what this passage is talking about. So let's start with falsehood, lying. Why do people lie? Why do you and I lie? Why do we deceive other people? I discovered that a renowned psychologist by the name of Paul Ekman did a study some years ago about this very question. Why do people lie? And he came up with nine reasons that he felt like covered all of it. And I'm not going to go into all of those, but listen to some of the, the, uh, the ones that really stuck out to me. People lie to avoid being punished. People lie to obtain a reward that they couldn't otherwise obtain. People lie to win admiration from others. And people lie to avoid embarrassment. Now, just thinking about those four reasons, what are the heart motivations behind those reasons? There's fear. There's insecurity. There's perhaps greed, lying to get something that you want. Uh, there's desire for acceptance, desire for others to love you and see you in a certain light. You can see why that's inconsistent with life in Christ. Because if once you're in Christ, you're completely accepted by the Father, so you don't have to fight and work for acceptance. You're completely secure in the Father's love. You've been, <clears throat> excuse me, you have nothing to fear because the Almighty God of the universe is on your side now, and God promises to provide for you. So as an unbeliever, you use lies to get what you want or thought you needed. But now that you've been redeemed, Paul says, put that away. That is no longer to be your way of life. Now you are to pursue truth. Now you are to speak truth. When we lie, we are evidencing a lack of trust in God. When we lie to make ourselves fit in with our fellow believers, we're not revealing our, our true selves, and therefore we're distancing ourselves from them. We're putting distance between us and our spiritual family. God wants us to be united as a community of faith. He wants us to be united under the headship of Christ. And lying is one of the sinful words that breaks that unity. Another example of sinful speech is speaking out of anger. Now notice that he says, be angry and sin not. Because as you know, it is possible to be angry in a righteous way. Anger in and of itself is not a sinful thing. There are times, in fact, when anger is the right response to injustice or unrighteousness. But let me give you an example of being angry and allowing that anger to lead you into sin with your words. Let's suppose that I was supposed to meet you at the gym 7 p.m., I mean the gym here on campus. I don't, I don't go to gyms. It's, it's not my... Uh, the gym here on campus to open the door for you so that you could set up for an activity that you had the next day. So I say, okay, we'll meet there at 7 o'clock Tuesday night. And you arrive, 6.55. You know, I'm not there yet. So you're watching your watch. It gets 7, 7.05, 7.10, 7.15. So you're starting to wonder what in the world's going on. So you give me a call. And I tell you that I completely forgot about it. I'll be up there just as soon as I can. So it's 7.45 by the time I get there. Now, at this point, you do have the right to be angry with me because I didn't fulfill my word, and it wasn't like some emergency came up. I just flat out forgot about it. But how you respond to me will determine whether or not you're letting that anger lead you into sin. So if I walk up to you and I'm apologetic and we go up to the doors to open them and then you just unload all your anger and frustration on me. I can't believe you're so unreliable. How could you do this to me? You ruined my whole evening. How can they make an idiot like you, the youth pastor at this church? If you just pour out all that, that venom, then you are being angry and sinning. So the righteous response would be to withhold those evil, hurtful words and express your anger in a, in a better way, like 
you know, Slay, that was really frustrating for me because threw off my evening. I was really depending on you. Uh, you know, and you could ask me to, to pay you back in some way. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so that's being angry and sinning. And, and, and God saying, put away anger as a tool for dealing with frustration and dependence. Put away lying as a tool for getting through life. God wants us also to put away corrupting talk. Now, that's actually talking about uh, words that hurt or tear down other people. He's saying, put that away as a way of interacting with other people, as a way of trying to make yourself look better, as a way of trying to fit in. Now, let's look for just a minute at the godly words that should replace these, because it's one thing to say, okay, put Craig Morton on the bench, but you've got to have Staubach ready, right, to step into the, the starting role. So let's see what God says about uh, the replacements for these. Let each one of you speak the truth with his neighbor. Speak only such as is good for building up, as fits the occasion. Be kind to one another. So, for instance, to combat your tendency to lie, speak the truth. And as you speak the truth regularly, that becomes more habitual and is taking the place of the lies that you did before. Don't try to deceive people. Give people the real story, even if it makes you look bad. And what about this speaking in a way that builds people up or fits the occasion? If you're speaking what is good for building up, then you're speaking what is helpful or needful for a brother or sister in Christ. So, for instance, if someone comes to you and they're struggling with a particular sin, let's say the sin they're struggling with is lying. I just, man, I get in difficult situations, and I just lie to get my way out of it. I'm, I'm, I'm having trouble. Now, you could use your words to really condemn them and beat them down. That is ungodly. It's devilish. I, I can't believe you would do that. You need to stop doing that immediately, that kind of thing. Or you could point them toward the grace of God. Obviously, remind them that sinning is wrong, that it is a sin against God who is the way, the truth, and the life but also pointing them toward the grace of God, that there is forgiveness and strength and encouragement from him. <clears throat> now, Paul also gives us a few motives for replacing these sinful words with godly words. He mentions we're members one of another. Uh, he says not to give any opportunity to the devil. And then he mentions uh, with regards to speaking gracious words that it may give grace to those who hear. You and your brother and sister in Christ are members of the same body. If you have put your faith in Christ and I have put my faith in Christ, then both of us have been united to Christ and united to one another spiritually. 1 Corinthians 12, 13 says, For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Now, if you're walking through the woods and your eyes perceive a low-hanging branch that your head would hit, it would be ridiculous if your eye would lie to your brain and say, oh, no, no, everything's clear and let you just walk right into that branch, right? Because your eye is part of the same body as your head. So your eye cares about what happens to your head. Well, Paul's saying that is just as foolish as you, who's a member of the same body as another believer, lying to another believer, deceiving another believer. Should be just as unthink unthinkable as it would be for our eyes to lie to our head. Uh, he also touches on giving no opportunity to the devil, excuse me, giving no opportunity to the devil, and says your, says your words should give grace to those who hear. So if we allow anger to influence what we say, basically if we speak out of anger, if we speak in a way to vent our frustrations or anger to our brothers or sisters in Christ, the devil is going to use that to drive a wedge between you and this brother and sister. He's going to use it to stir up bitterness. He's going to use it to stir up division. And we don't want to give him that opportunity. Paul is saying, you want to work against the devil, then don't dwell on your anger. Don't use your anger. Uh, don't, don't let anger control what you say. Okay, let's look at the second command. Replace sinful attitudes with godly attitudes. To me, this is the most difficult category to tackle. Because words are pub public, right? There's witnesses. There are witnesses to your words. But attitudes can hide in your heart for years without anybody knowing. You can show, and, and I think East Texans are some of the best at this, showing a smiling, happy face. Uh, you know, God bless you, brother. Gl glad to see you. When there's an attitude that is saying just the opposite inside. <clears throat> Paul lists quite a few sinful attitudes. Look at some of these. I'll go back to anger again. Be angry and, and do not sin. Do not the, let the sun go down in your anger. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. I, as I mentioned, I included anger in, in this category as well because not only can anger be 
expressed in words, but anger can be a settled attitude against someone. Uh, for instance, you could tell me when I get there to the gym 45 minutes late to open the door for me, you could tell me, ah, oh, it's no problem, I'm not bothered by it a bit, and just go about your business, but you could still be harboring anger, thinking those things that you didn't say, and that would drive a wedge between us because then you'd probably avoid me. You'd probably not want to interact with me because you'd have this anger toward me. Now, when he adds that we shouldn't let the sun go down on our anger, what he's saying is that we shouldn't hold on to our anger. We, shouldn't, we, we should work to release our anger, to let it go as soon as possible. Otherwise, we're giving the devil, again, an opportunity to capitalize on that. He'll use it to put more distance between you and your brother or sister, to divide the body of Christ, and to weaken the church's witness. And, and by the way, this, uh, this is not saying that it's okay to hold on to your anger as long as the sun is still up. That's not what's going on there. Because that would mean if you live in central Greenland, there are times when you'd have months where you could hold on to your anger. The sun still hasn't gone down, Lord. I'm good. I'm still hanging on to that. Now, the point of the matter is that you need to get rid of your anger as soon as possible. You need to face it. You need to take it to the Lord. And then you need to let go of it. Don't let it be what's controlling your attitude. Now, I recognize that that is 10 million times easier said than done. I know that you may be sitting there thinking, Slade, you, you don't know what person X has done to me. You don't know how I've been hurt. You don't know how I've been wrong. And that is true. That is absolutely true. But, what, but I do know that Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth was wronged and hurt more than any person in the history of the world. He suffered more than anyone ever suffered, more than all of us put together, and all of it was unjust, and yet he forgave. So because he is now living in you, you are able to let go of that anger just as much as the Lord Jesus is. And again, I, I, I recognize it may be a struggle. You may have to let go of anger toward a particular person a thousand times in a given month, <clears throat> but it's a work that the Lord calls us to because you have new life in Christ Put that anger aside. Now look for just a minute at this vile list in verse 31. Bitterness, wrath, anger, and malice. All of these words speak of an attitude of hatred that wants evil to come upon someone. And that is the habit. That, that's the way that Gentiles, standing in for unbelievers in this passage, that that's the way unbelievers live. They will hold on to uh, uh, anger that will, that will uh, develop into bitterness and then they live with a desire to bring evil or a desire that harm would come into someone's life, basically hatred. And the Bible is saying that we have to put that away because we have this new life in Christ. We don't need the weapons of bitterness and malice anymore. Unbelievers use these to protect themselves, to defend themselves, to get revenge. But for a believer, hatred and animosity are no longer acceptable options. The Lord is your protector, the Lord is your defender, and the Lord is the one who holds revenge in his hands. So you can see how it gets back to that trust issue again, right? If I let go of malice toward this person, can I trust that God is going to take care of this unjust situation that they're perpetuating? If I let go of hatred toward this person, can I trust that God is still going to protect me, that God is still going to uh, <clears throat> allow me to live my life? in joy and contentment. Now here are the replacements that he mentions for sinful attitudes. Down in verse 32, uh, verse 31, be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Be kind, be tender-hearted, which means to be affectionate or compassionate, be forgiving. Replace your malice with affection or compassion. Now again, I recognize that's not a simple thing to do, especially if you've been deeply hurt by someone that's very close to you. I recognize that you can't just flip a switch and go, oh man, I feel so affectionate toward this person right now. So here would be my advice. If, you, if you're struggling with a particular person, feeling this anger, this malice, this hatred toward them, pray for them. Start praying that God would move in their lives. Start praying that God would draw them closer. You don't have to pray that they get a promotion. You don't have to pray that God... It helps them win the lottery or something like that. Pray that God will bless them with his presence and his joy. And as you intercede for someone, you'll find your affection toward them starting to turn. You'll start caring about them because you'll feel connected to them. You'll want what's best for them rather than wanting pain for them. And then he mentions forgiveness, forgiving one another as God in Christ 
forgave you. If your attitude toward other believers who wronged you <clears throat> is forgiving, then you will not become bitter because you will be able to release that. You can say, okay, I've forgiven you. I have forgiven that person for what they've done. Now, that doesn't preclude the fact that there may be people that you have to talk to. You know, uh, Adam McMahon. <laughs> Sorry, where is Adam? I'm always using for an example. If Adam McMahon wronged me, okay, it would be perfectly right and honest. Is he hiding? Where is he? Oh, he's over there. Okay. Adam has never wronged me. That's why I can use this example. But suppose Adam had wronged me, and so I was feeling anger. Okay, I can, I can go to the Lord and say, Lord, I forgive, forgive him for this. But I knew, do need to go to Adam, if it's a big enough deal, and say, Adam, here's what happened. And that really hurt me. And then we'd be able to reconcile from there. Hopefully. Will you accept that? Will you? No. <laughs> He's not. Forgiveness frees us to love our church family. Because someone in the church is going to offend you. Someone in the church is going to hurt you. Someone in the church is going to disappoint you. And you have offended people. You have hurt people. You have disappointed people. It's called being sinful humans. That is, that is exactly, uh, that's the case for all of us, excuse me. But if you can live in the light of the truth that God in Christ forgave you what you deserve, deserved, then you're able to Extend that forgiveness to your brothers and sisters. Replace sinful attitudes with godly attitudes. The last command is this. Replace sinful actions with godly actions. Now this one I won't spend a whole lot of time on. Uh, because I, I feel like the, uh, the thoughts and the words, excuse me, the attitudes and the words really tend to drive our behavior. So the actions really flow more from those than, than driving them. But there is a behavior that he mentions here. Uh, in verse 26. 28, I'll get it right. Uh, he says, let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. Now, probably most believers don't struggle with stealing things, but apparently in that day it was fairly common in their society, uh, the, the pagan society, to steal in order to get what you wanted or get what you needed. And so when these people came to Christ in Ephesus, of course, that's the old habits die hard, so they would still do that, I'm sure, steal from one another when they wanted something. And so Paul was saying, no, wait a second, you're now a new creature in Christ, so, so that needs to put away from you. So you, again, you're trusting in God to provide for you rather than trying to uh, work things out on your own. And he gives this great antidote to stealing. Okay, you have a problem trying to take other people's stuff. Well, get a job and work hard, and then you will have stuff of your own and you will be able to share with someone in need. And you can see how that would work as a perfect rehabilitation, if you will, for someone who was a thief. If they started, instead of wanting to take what wasn't theirs, if they started actually giving away what was theirs, then they are exercising trust in the Lord instead of distrust that he is going to provide. Now, he also touches at the, the uh, verses 31 and 32 uh, bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice, all of those. Uh, attitudes can also reveal themselves in actions. And uh, just as the remedy for the sinful thoughts and the sinful words was being kind, tenderhearted, and forgiving, it's the same thing here for sinful actions. God, God calls us to treat each other with kindness, do good for one another, serve one another, help one another. It builds community within the church and it displays the life of Christ to everyone around you because one of the ways that we witness to the world around us is by our love for one another. So you see why Paul is so insistent that the Ephesians demonstrate love for one another in the relationships in the church because we are telling the church, this is what it looks like to be a redeemed people of God. Not perfectly, but that is what we're aiming toward. And so the more consistently that we do that, that is giving God greater glory among, under, other, among unbelievers. My apologies. <clears throat> Okay, let's get to the last command. This is the big one. Don't grieve the Holy Spirit. Delight the Holy Spirit. To me, this is the most powerful motive for replacing sinful words, thoughts, and actions with godly ones. Because it's one thing to think about how your thoughts and words and behaviors affect your fellow believers. But it is an entirely other thing to think that your sinful words, actions, and behaviors affect 
the very Spirit of God. And just to make sure that we don't take this lightly, Paul mentions the other two persons of the Holy Trinity as well. Verses 30 to 32, it says, And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and, and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. Do not cause the Spirit grief, sorrow, or sadness. Now, since this statement follows all those specific commands that he gave, I think it's telling us that lying to one another, harboring anger to one another, stealing from one another, and tearing one another down grieves the Spirit. When you're teaching young kids the importance of obeying God, you might tell them sometimes that when they disobey, it makes God sad. Have any of y'all ever told your kids that? No, that's okay. Uh, when you disobey, it makes God sad. Now, I have always, I've probably said that to my kids before, but I've always recoiled at that thought because it sounds so weird to think, okay, you do something wrong and that makes God sad. It kind of makes God sound like he's over in a corner crying all the time because I'm you know, doing these wrong things. <clears throat> but here it is, straight in Scripture, right? He says, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God. So the point is that our behavior, our thoughts, our actions, our words, do affect the Spirit of God. He, is actually, he actually experiences sorrow or sadness when we do what divides the body of Christ. His sorrow doesn't dominate his existence, but it's important to realize that the Holy Spirit cares deeply about how you treat other believers. Author Mark Roberts links this grieving of the Spirit's work, excuse me, this grieving that the Spirit experiences to the Spirit's work. He says this, Since the Spirit forms the community of God's people, and since the unity of God's people is central to God's cosmic purposes, anything we do that divides this community distresses the Spirit. I think he's on to an important point. Ephesians 2.22 says that believers are being built together into a dwelling place for God by the Spirit. The Spirit is working to unite believers so that what we say, excuse me, so that when we say something, think something, or do something that hurts that unity, we're actually working against the Spirit, and that grieves him. And Paul adds that it is by the Holy Spirit that we were sealed for the day of redemption. Ephesians 1, 13 and 14 also talked about it. it. says that when we learned, excuse me, when we heard the gospel and believed in Christ, we were sealed with the promised Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it. So when he talks about being sealed by the Spirit, what he's saying is the indwelling Spirit is our seal of ownership that we are owned by Almighty God. It is also a seal that protects us. From being taken away from Almighty God. Just as a uh, king in those days would seal something that he didn't want any, anyone to open. If the king's seal was on there, you wouldn't touch it. The Lord's seal is on, on us. Therefore, we cannot be taken out of the family of God. The Lord's seal is on us. That means we are authentically owned by Almighty God. And because you were sealed and marked as belonging to God in the Spirit, you should uh, want to delight the Spirit. Your response should be gratitude and joy over what the Spirit has done for you. Not grieve Him, but bring Him delight. Do what pleases Him. Do what makes Him happy, if you will. So if you love God, if you've been born again, you love God. If you love God, you want to please Him. You want to delight Him. And you do that by replacing sinful words, thoughts, and actions with godly words, thoughts, and actions. Don't grieve the Spirit. Delight the Spirit. I'll sum it up this way. Show your new identity in Christ by treating one another with love, which delights the Holy Spirit. You have new life in Christ. Walk in that new life by treating other believers with love. If you scream at others to get your way, that's clamor and you need to repent. If you tear down others with your words, that's unwholesome words and you need to repent. If you hold on to your anger or your malice or your bitterness towards someone... You need to repent. Turn away from those thoughts and attitudes and actions of your old self. Replace them with God's ways of dealing with one another. Show your new identity in Christ by treating one another with love, which delights the Holy Spirit. Here are a few ways that you can respond to the truth of this passage. The first is this. 
Rewrite, it, rewrite, my W's are not coming out well today, and my R's. Rewrite Ephesians 4, 25 to, through 32 in your own words. Uh, our lead pastor encourages us to do this every week. It's a way of really thinking about what the passage says. Because when you have to put something in your own words, you have to understand the words that you're trying to reword. All of you guys that have been through school have had to do this sometimes with literature. They'll give you a paragraph from a famous piece of literature and say, hey, rewrite this in your own words. And your response is like, well, I don't know, it looks pretty good like it is. I'm good. <clears throat> but rewriting it in our own words forces us to understand it and, and, and it sinks more deeply into our minds. Uh, second response, tell another believer how they've been a blessing. This would be a way that you can speak in, a, uh, in words that build up. Maybe you've seen someone consistently serving others or being welcoming to visitors. Let them know about that. So they're encouraged to know the work of God in their lives, and they'll be blessed. You can ask the Lord to show you if you're treating others sinfully. Oh, man. So here's the, here's the repentance, repentance portion of the uh, response. So it's easy for all of us to imagine people. Man, yeah, I know a guy who does that. That guy always lies when he gets into a tight situation. I know a guy that, man, he... He gets upset at somebody, he's just going to scream and unload. I know a guy, I know a girl, but let's think about ourselves for just a minute. Ask the Lord to show you, Lord, am I doing any of these things? Are any of these things my habit? And if they are, you confess that, you receive his forgiveness, and you ask for his strength to replace it with a godly habit. And finally, let me urge you to show kindness to another believer this week. These godly ways of treating, each, uh, treating others applies, like I said, to unbelievers as well as believers. But since the focus of this passage is relationships in the body of Christ, practice it by showing kindness to another believer. You can invite them over for a meal, especially if that uh, other believer is a college student. You could uh, offer to babysit their kids. I mean, not the ones that have adult kids, little kids. Uh, you can, Show kindness to someone by looking for a need and then filling that need. Show your new identity in Christ by treating one another with love, which delights the Holy Spirit. Let me pray for us. Lord God in heaven, thank you for all that you are. Thank you for all that you've done for us. Lord, thank you for revealing your word to us. Thank you for showing us the path of love, Lord, for, for pointing out to, out to us, this is where you're sinning, and this is where you go right. God, I pray that your spirit would convict us where we are using words or attitudes or actions in a sinful way. I pray that your spirit would drive us, Lord, to, to live a life that is blessing our fellow believers and also those around us that are unbelievers. Live a life that speaks to other people in gracious, life-giving words. That acts toward other people in service. That has an attitude of, of love and care for our fellow person. God, thank you for what you have done for us in Christ Jesus. I pray for your great blessing on everyone who has gathered here this morning. If there are non-believers present, I pray you would convict them of their sin and draw them to the open and waiting arms of Christ who stands ready to forgive. And for those who do know you, Lord, I pray that you would grow us this week. One more step in maturity as we fight against the tendency to speak and think and act sinfully. Lord, I commend all of these people into your hands. In your holy name, amen. We have gone on a journey this morning. Holy Spirit has taken us on a journey. We started by praising God because he has done great things. And we have been reminded that he has done great things in watching over us and protecting us through the people who have served for this country. And we have been reminded that he is doing great things now around the world. With people like the McCords who are taking God's word and sharing the truth of God's word and making that truth tangible to people who do not have it. And we have seen that God is doing great things in this community and in this church as people who are the least of these, orphans, people who need a home, are finding homes. One of the things that we have said about God this morning is that he is so close to us, he is emotionally invested in us as individuals and as a church. 
And so we want to wrap up this morning by pointing out some ways that you can be involved uh, with this church. And you should have received one of these on your way in. And really just want to point out that you should read that. But if you're college age or career age, it's important for you to be connected with other believers in the way that Slade has talked about this morning, the way that God's word has talked about. So go to the dinner that's happening tonight. Um, If you're a part of this church at any level, it's important for us to take the love of God that we have talked about this morning and make that tangible. And there are some very practical ways we can do that. There's information about Southward School and the Christmas gifts that we want to collect for them. And you'll see the Christmas trees right out there. Stop by there and get information about that. And we've got a food drive that's coming up through Awana, through the Sparks. Again, you'll find more details about this in the bulletin. But but take a look at that and get involved in doing exactly what Slade has talked about and what we've talked about this morning. God is doing great things. Would you stand with me as we dismiss? And I'm going to invite the prayer team to come forward. If you need prayer about anything, would you please come talk to one of us this morning? Let us pray with you. Let us share with you. Let us support you and encourage you. God is so near to us that he is emotionally invested in you and in this church. So our challenge this morning is to leave here and delight him. You are dismissed.